In this video, we're going to take apart an I.O. board from inside an HP 83000 digital IC test system. I spent a lot of time looking for stuff on eBay, and one day I stumbled across this paperweight. After a bit of research, I discovered that this is a module from an I.O. board in the HP 83000, so I picked one up. The part number for this I.O. board is E2771-66502 and would have been one of up to 32 I.O. boards in a single system. Each I.O. board has 16 channels, meaning that a fully loaded 83000 system has a maximum capacity of 512 I.O. channels for testing integrated circuits. What I'm specifically interested in about this I.O. board are the hybrid modules used for interfacing with the channels. There are a total of eight of these hybrid ceramic modules, two on either side of a cooling block, which connects to a cooling channel that would have been connected to an external cooling system via the included tubes. This I.O. board is actually made up of three different circuit boards connected together to form a circuit sandwich. What I've designated as the top circuit board is attached to the bottom circuit board using nuts and screws. The nuts easily come off and the screws are soldered in place on the bottom board. After removing all of the nuts and a few additional screws, the two halves can be pried apart. On the top half is the third circuit board, which is only held in place by the connectors that it's plugged into. My guess is that they needed to add this third circuit board in order to keep the tops and bottoms of the fully assembled I.O. unit flat and free of components due to how close the I.O. boards are to one another once they get installed into the 8300 system. The rest of the upper circuit board has cutouts for the relays that exist on the hybrid modules along with gold pads for interfacing with them. It also has some hidden text letting us know that this is only 50% of a sandwich board. Setting the top aside, we can move over to the bottom, which is where all of the hybrid modules live. There's quite a bit of stuff here, in addition to the modules themselves, the majority of which is used for cooling. The circuit board also has some more through-hole integrated circuits, similar to the top half. With a bit of wiggling, the whole module assembly pulls right up. It's at this point that we can finally get confirmation that this are the other 50% of the sandwich board. Instead of using traditional connectors on these modules, they instead opted to use elastomeric connector strips, like what you might find in certain LCD applications. The elastomeric connector is made up of hundreds of tiny metal wires separated by an insulator. When squished together between two surfaces, the metal wires will make contact with the board surfaces, but because of the insulator, they won't short to themselves. Based on my measurements, the spacing between conductors is approximately 100 micrometers, which translates to roughly 10 wires per millimeter. Each I.O. module has six of these elastomeric strips, meaning that there are 48 for this entire circuit board assembly. The pads they mate with are different sizes, which I'm sure depends on the current needed for each pin. Each I.O. channel has a single shielded wire soldered to the hybrid module. All 16 of these yellow wires meet up at a single connector for interfacing with the rest of the system. Sadly, it wasn't until later that I discovered that the wires actually unplug from this connector, meaning that I didn't necessarily need to clip the wires on the modules. That being said, it's probably better not to have wires dangling from the module while it's on the microscope. With the module removed from the assembly, we can finally get a good look at how it's put together. The module consists of a thick metal block with one hybrid ceramic module on either side. The result is a pretty compact design. The next step is to remove the ceramic lid from the rest of the module. Typically, these types of ceramic lids are held in place with adhesive and can be easily removed after heating the module up to the point that the adhesive starts to weaken. I thought this would be a good time to remove the relays while the module is hot, but I ended up just creating a huge mess. I did eventually come back to them later and remove them with more heat. When I think the module is hot enough, I'll use a pair of pliers to try and pull the lid off. I was actually worried that the entire ceramic circuit board would come with, but it ended up just being the lid. 
Before we can take a closer look at the module, it needs to cool down. I'll put it on an aluminum heatsink to help speed it up. After everything is cooled down, we can finally look at it with a microscope. On one end of the circuit board, we can see the shielded cables soldered directly to it. Both the inner signal wire and the shield are soldered in place. Overall, I find this hybrid ceramic module absolutely stunning. There are a total of 8 silicon integrated circuits, 10 silicon diodes, and a large amount of ceramic capacitors and laser trim resistors. During the remainder of this video, I'll be looking at each integrated circuit under the microscope with the intent of trying to figure out what each one is to help get a better understanding of what this module is doing. Let's look at this one first. This first integrated circuit appears to be from AT&T and looks like it has a lot of extra space and unused circuit elements on it. There are two copies of this chip on this module, so I assume that means one per channel. This part includes the numbers LB1585A2 and ALA402, which I unfortunately wasn't able to find a perfect match for. The closest I came to finding out what these are was from an AT&T data book stored on the BitSavers website. In this data book from 1988, it references the ALA400 and 401 as being linear arrays listed under the semi-custom array products. It's plausible then that the ALA402 is a custom chip similar to the ALA400 and 401 made just for this application. This chip also includes three sets of initials, BWM, RRJ, and JWB, who I assume are some of the designers. The second chip appears to be made by VSLI and includes the text MUDAC in one of the corners. In the context of an integrated circuit, I think that DAC is referring to the fact that this is a digital to analog converter with the MU being the Greek letter MU, which is the common symbol used for micro. Or perhaps I'm reading too much into the name MUDAC. The part number VY05931A also doesn't give any clues as to what this part actually is. If you've got any ideas as to what this part might be or can find any additional information on it, definitely let me know. Above this chip is the identical copy of the first chip. Both of the AT&T chips are connected to the VSLI part. This next chip is made by Siemens, and it is also a unique one that doesn't have a duplicate. In addition to a copyright date of 1990, the only other text on this chip is E3041A1 and S844B, neither of which lead to any useful information about what this particular chip is. Zooming into the chip, we can see that there are many unused circuit elements, which makes me think that this is yet another custom design made just for this application. Below this chip is a chip from Harris Semiconductor, and it is perhaps my favorite of them all because of its colors. This chip has a mask works and copyright date of 1992, and also includes a bunch of numbers. Among these numbers are 5062-7A1, HFA-5251, and 5062-7A225, which looks like it's written over some other numbers. This chip contains many laser trimmed resistors, along with a bunch of pads that say no bond next to them, which I thought was interesting. Continuing common theme on the previous parts, there are plenty of unused circuit elements hanging out all over this chip. Unlike the other parts though, this part number actually led to a match. According to the datasheet, the HFA5251 is an 800 MHz monolithic pin driver. This chip was manufactured using a proprietary complementary bipolar UHF-1 process. I included a link to the datasheet in the description of this video if you wanted to take a look at it for yourself. As you might have guessed from this being a monolithic pin driver, there are two of these chips on the module. 
one for each channel. The datasheet also includes a chip level diagram, which would be very helpful when tracing out how this fits into the rest of the circuit board. Following the output of the HFA 5251, we make our way over to another pair of integrated circuits. This is another chip made by AT&T, and it's very interesting to look at. Among the numbers included on this chip are 1249, UB1584A2, and ALA210, along with the same three initials from the previous AT&T chip, and one new one, IAK. Similar to the other AT&T part, the closest I came to finding out about what this part was is from the same AT&T databook from before. It references the ALA201 and 202 as being UHF linear arrays, also listed under the semi-custom array products. It's very possible that the ALA210 is another device in this family because they do look very similar. The databook also goes on to list AT&T's custom capabilities, so it's not too far-fetched to think that these were all custom designs for HP and this specific application. The AT&T databook is also linked in the description down below. In addition to the integrated circuits, there are many silicon diodes scattered across the circuit board. They are rather strange looking diodes with two circles on the top, one of which is for the wire to bond to. Overall, there are essentially two copies of every circuit on this board. The design is almost mirrored horizontally across the middle, but there are a few differences. This circuit board also seems to be a lot more complex than I would have originally expected it to be. It would have been nice to find datasheets for all of the integrated circuits on this module so that I would be able to understand it better, but I'm just grateful I was able to find any of them at all. Unfortunately though, this is where I'm going to have to end this investigation, at least for now. I could spend a lot of time tracing out the circuit board and making a nice diagram, but since my knowledge of many of the chips is incomplete, I would most likely need to make a lot of assumptions. I would definitely like to revisit this effort in the future though, if I'm able to find out more about the chips, or my knowledge of chip structures advances to the point that I could figure it out for myself. For the time being though, I have many other projects that I'm working on and would like to finish, so it's time to move on from this one. Additionally, there are other modules used in the HP83000 system that I'd like to take a look at, but those are on a different circuit board. That will have to be the subject of another video. I'm glad that I was able to find where the hybrid ceramic module from the original paperweight came from and had the chance to look at the silicon chips on it for myself. At some point I'll be posting the stitch versions of these chips so that everyone can take a look at them for themselves. Or perhaps you're watching this video in the future, in which case they already exist. More info on the location of where you can view them will be added to the description once they become available, and I'll also make a community post so if you're subscribed you won't miss it when they go live. On the topic of subscribing, did the subscribe button do something cool when I said subscribe? I noticed that if you aren't subscribed to a channel and someone mentions subscribing in their video, the subscribe button lights up. Anyways, if you enjoy this content and want to see more of it in the future, I would appreciate it if you subscribed. I have many more interesting things to look at like in this video, along with a few personal projects that I've been working on that will be going live soon. If you haven't already, I would highly recommend checking out the Chip Chat Discord. And with all that said, I'll see you in the next chip.